We've been in a series called Seeing and Hearing in the Spirit. Uh, and, and as I was debating as to what to do with this, because uh, I'll be honest with you, my big struggle was I love the Scripture and the Old Testament story so much. I asked God if we could just kind of stay in that vein and dig out Revelation and Scripture. And he said, that's about you. Let's move on. So... <laughs> Uh, what we're, I, I don't see us leaving this topic until we talk about the demonic and seeing and hearing the demonic. So this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about demons. Now, uh, I, I want you to be aware that there is no way in a 30-minute uh, conversation that I can cover this topic well. Uh, and so I'm going to refer you to a past message we've done. It's on the YouTube site, and it's on our website. Uh, the message title was, Let's Talk About Demons. Uh, so if you want a little more depth as far as uh, what we believe about the demonic and the presence in the life of a believer and those kind of things, you'll get an extended version there. What I'll do this morning is kind of give you a quick cleft notes of that. So as you hear what I have to say this morning and it intrigues you and you want to dig further, go back to that message called Let's Talk About Demons. But what do demons do here on this earth? What they do is they torment Emotionally and physically, they tempt and they lure you away from God. I want to put it in kind of a nutshell. Their desire is for you to submit to Satan. Their desire is for you to step over into the kingdom of darkness with them and follow their leader. There is an eternal battle going on here that's already been won by Christ between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Uh, and, and what they're trying to do is persuade you out of the things of the kingdom of light till you submit to the kingdom of darkness. They can indeed have a power over people. The scripture tells us that they can influence us and they can have a power over us but quite honestly, as a believer, you have to give them permission to do that. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that in a minute, so bear with me. The Bible talks about demons 83 times in just the New Testament. 25% of Jesus' ministry is the deliverance and dedication to issues with demons. Jesus sent people out with authority over demons in Matthew 10 and in Mark 6, 17. Believers can cast out demons. But let's talk about who they are a little bit and how they react. Demons have a will. In Mark 5, 11 through 13, they ask, can you send us into the swine? They have emotion. In James 2, 19, it says that demons believe in God and they tremble. They have knowledge. In Mark 1, 21 through 28, they knew who Jesus was. They have a self-awareness. In Mark 5, 9, Jesus asked the demons their name, and they answered. Uh, they have an ability to speak. In Mark 1, 26, the Spirit cried out its name. In Mark 5, 9, it says, My name is Legion, for we are many. Acts 19, 15, they said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Sons of Sceva. Um, they have false doctrines in 1 Timothy 4, 1, through 2, uh, 1 and 2. It says they are seducing spirits with doctrines of demons. But with all that said, demons have no a power or authority over Jesus. And Jesus has given you the authority to deal with demons. As a believer, you have authority over the demonic. Deliverance should be a normal part of church because they're here and they need to be cast out. And it's the job of the church and the believer to clean the house. So the big question that always comes up when we talk about demons is, can a Christian be possessed by a demon? Now, that's a, a bigger question, but I'm going to break it down briefly. Again, you can go back to this sermon if you want more information on it. But the two things you need to understand when you're dealing with Christians and demons is the word possessed in the New Testament and the difference between your body, your soul, and your spirit. Let me break that down very briefly for you. The Bible speaks of people being demon-possessed 14 different times. And some would say, yeah, but a Christian cannot have demon oppression, cannot be possessed. Like Christians can't. Why? Because in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15, it says, what fellowship has light with darkness? Listen to me. That scripture is not talking about demons. 
It's talking about being married to an unbeliever, which in fact can be very similar. <laughs> but it's not talking about demons and Christian being in the same place. Another scripture used is James 3.11. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? You can't have fresh and bitter water, so Christians and demons can't be in the same place. And that scripture is not talking about demons. It's talking about the power of the tongue and the damage a tongue can do in cursing and blessing, not demons. If we are to believe that demons and the Holy Spirit cannot both exist in an in individual, in a believer, listen to me, that a demon and the Holy Spirit cannot exist in a believer, then how is it that we believe that the Holy Spirit and sin can exist in a believer? How do we believe that the Holy Spirit and sickness can exist in one person. You know, if the argument is, well, the Holy Spirit's here, so a demon can't be here, I'm struggling with that because sin can be there, because sickness can be there. So we go back to the real question of demon possession and what did it mean in Scripture? There are two words for uh, possession in Scripture in the New Testament. The first one is echo, echo in the Greek. It means to own something or it to be in your possession. Like Abraham possessed the land, like the rich man possessed great wealth. He owned it. He had it. He had it in his possession. The second word used is daimonizomai, daimonizomai, and it means under the power of, under the power of the demonic. Now, you have to remember, we cannot be owned by the demonic. Why? Because we were bought with a price, Jesus Christ. So we cannot be owned by the demonic. But there is an opportunity here that it talks about being under the power of the demonic. And let me show you how that works, because the next thing you have to understand is the body, the soul, and the spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a body. This is the thing we see on each other. You have a soul. That's what makes you, you, and me, me. It is our mind. It's our will, our emotion. And then you have a spirit, a spirit that was breathed into us by God in the book of Genesis, it says. And in Ephesians 2, it says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, but you were made alive in Christ. What was made alive? He was talking to people. He didn't say you guys used to be in the grave and you came out. He didn't say your soul used to be dead. He was saying that in your spirit you were dead in sin, but you were made alive in Christ in the spirit, the triad, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are made in His image, body, soul, and spirit. And the spirit was dead in trespasses and sin, and it was brought to to life in Christ. In Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. But Jesus brought you to life when you came to know him. The Holy Spirit came to dwell in you. And I know this is um, uh, splitting hairs, but it's theologically important. You are composed of a body, a soul, and a spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, He does not come to dwell in your physical. He does not come to dwell in your soul. He comes to dwell in your spirit. Why? Because He is spirit. So when your spirit is brought to life, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in your spirit. So your spirit is the holy of holies of the temple. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that his spirit dwells in you in the holy of holies beyond the veil. He is not in the outer courts. He is not in the temple. He is in the holy of holies. He's in your spirit. So your soul and your body are still outside of the spirit. When G- Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he says, how do I enter the kingdom of God? He says, you have to be born again. He says, how can I go back into the flesh of my mother's womb? And he says, no, no, flesh is flesh. I'm talking about being born again in the spirit. You've been born once in the flesh. Now you need to be born in the spirit. 
So the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. And once that Spirit is born again and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, you can't have sin, death, or corruption in your spirit. Because that's where the Holy Spirit is. You could not go past the veil with sin or you would die. Sin cannot come into your spirit because the Holy Spirit dwells in your spirit. But the soul of a man and the body of a man is still corrupt. Do you not know that Romans 12, 2 says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is still work to be done in the soul. The body is still corrupt. In Galatians 5, 17, the flesh is at war with the spirit. And an evil spirit, a demon, cannot enter your spirit. It is alive and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. But an evil spirit can, can have power over your soul and your body. You know this. How many believers do you know that have struggled with depression, suicide, or perversion? That is a demonic presence in the soul. In the body, how many believers do you know that have dealt with sickness, disease, and infirmity? It is an oppression in the body. So I want to look at the Bible's information on the work of demons in the believers. And I know for some of you, you're like, I can't believe we're going here because demons and the believers can't, can't be in the same place. Yes, there is an oppression. We cannot be possessed. We cannot be owned because we were bought with Christ. But we can be oppressed. Demons can come and bring a struggle, a trial, a depression evidence of that in scripture John 10 1 Jesus talking truly I say to you he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep who are the sheep us into the fold of the sheep but climbs in some other way he's a thief and a robber the enemy gets into the flock how the enemy gets in and plants in the flock fear plants in the flock anxiety Plants in the flock, depression. He's coming to steal joy. He's coming to steal that which is in the believer. He's coming to be a thief. Uh, what would you do if Scripture implicitly said that demons, uh, Christians can have demons? If the children of God can have demons? If you could read that directly in Scripture, would that put it to rest? Let's do that. In Mark 7, 24 through 30, we have the story of the Syrophoenician woman. Not a child of God, a Syrophoenician woman. She comes and says, my child has a demon. Will you cast it out? And Jesus, and in 26, it says, now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician way. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of the daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog's. Now, before you get offended, in Scripture, the dog is the unbeliever. You can go to the book of Revelations. It says those outside the gate were the dogs. So Jesus is not calling her a dog. He's saying you are not one of the children of God. But he just said, you want me to cast a demon out of your daughter, but this is something for the children of God, not for those who don't follow God. Did you see that? Jesus saying that deliverance is for the children of God, not for those who don't follow God. That's straight up in Scripture. That's what he's saying to her. I can't. You're a Gentile. I'm going to the Jew first, and this is for the children of God. It's not for you yet. A couple of New Testament Scriptures to note. Warnings of Satan in the Christian life, Ephesians 4, 25 through 27. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. That's the church. That's the body. Be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil opportunity. Opportunity for what? If a devil can't have an influence on us, what opportunity is open to the devil if we hold on to anger? And just so you know, that scripture is not talking about get right with your wife before you go to bed. Okay, so let's talk about it for a minute. How many times have you heard it preached? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath because you're giving the devil up the opportunity. 
Okay, so here's what we all believe. Well, before I go to bed, I got to make up with her because I can't let the sun go down on the wrath or I'm giving the devil the opportunity. Listen to what you're saying is it's okay for me to be angry with her and be in a fight when I'm awake. But if I go to sleep, it's a problem. <laughs> it's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is don't give the opportunity. Well, oh, watch this. You're going to blow your mind. He's saying, do not let the sun go down on your wrath toward the devil. Because you'll give him an opportunity if you're not constantly fighting. He's not talking about us between each other. He's saying, don't let the sun go down on your wrath against the enemy because you will give the enemy an opportunity. All right, we'll move on. 2 Corinthians 2.10. But one of whom you forgave anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Again, warning the church that there are schemes and opportunity that we can give the enemy, the demonic. In Ephesians 6.12, for our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we are going to fight and struggle with the demonic until we learn of our authority That struggle is a whole lot harder. Seeing and hearing demonic activity around you is a spiritual assessment. And let me just say, the majority of believers will not physically see and hear the demonic. What you will see and hear is the manifestation of the demonic. In other words, there are people who are gifted. I have once in my life seen a demon, but now I recognize that what I'm looking for is the manifestation, the fruit of the demonic. I'm looking for what is he doing? How is he moving? Where is he going? How do I see that? How do I recognize that? And if you'll notice, it says there's a scheme of the enemy. A scheme is a plan. It's a predetermined plan. If I have a scheme to do something, it's because I sat down and thought about how I'm going to deceive people, how I'm going to work this out, how I'm going to make it work to my result. This is what the enemy does. He schemes against us. I don't believe anywhere in scripture it says that the enemy can hear our thoughts. But man, can he hear our words. And man, do we give him opportunity with our words. Man, do we just lay it out there what we're struggling with so he knows where to attack. Man, do we lay it out there in criticism and judgment so he can say, yeah, I can use this. I think he manipulates the situation. I think he maneuvers around what we're saying and what we're doing. Listen, I've said this before, and I'm not giving the devil any credence. I'm trying to help us understand how to step up. He's been dealing with us for 6,000 years. You've been dealing with him for maybe 40 or 50 He sees patterns. He sees the way we move, the way we act, the way humans are. And he takes advantage of that. And we have to be sharper than that. I see that we have to be able to look at the manifestations of the demonic and say, that's a demon at work. And if that's a demon at work, I've got to go after the demon to fix the situation. If you don't diagnose correctly, you're wasting your time. Listen, we got little Victory in the hospital right now. And little Victory was having a problem breathing. And if she'd have gone to the doctor and the doctor says, well, I think you got a lung infection. Here, take this antibiotic and go home. She has been diagnosed wrong because she had a mass in her chest that was restricting her airways that's now in the process of being torn apart by Jesus and removed from her little body. But in order to know it was there, they had to go take an x-ray. They had to look deeper. They had to look closer. They had to say, what's really going on here? So I want to talk about the manifestations of the demonic so we can begin seeing the demonic move. In Mark 9 and uh, 25 and Matthew 10, 1, it says they're unclean spirits. 2 Timothy 1, 7, spirits of fear. 1 Timothy 4, 1, deceitful spirits. Luke 11, uh, 13, 11, a spirit of infirmity. Acts 16, 16, a spirit of divination. We're going to talk about that. Romans 8, 15, the spirit of bondage. Romans 11, 8, the spirit of stupor. Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 12, the spirit of this world. Uh, uh, 1 John 4, 3, the spirit of Antichrist. It's not an all-inclusive list. I'm just trying to tell you what things you're looking for. You're looking for infirmity. You're looking for divination. You're looking for bondage. 
There's several deliverances that are listed in the New Testament. So what can we learn about seeing the manifestation of a demon by the deliverance that was shown in Scripture? In other words, what was going on there that made it obvious there was a demon in play and we needed to deal with the demon? So I want to go back and look at a couple of these. The first one I want to look at is the demoniac of the Gerasenes, or of Gadarenes, as your Scripture may call it. We're talking about the, the far side of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus goes over in a boat, and when he gets out of the boat, he gets approached. And in Mark 5, 1, it says this, They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, Jesus, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. The man was living among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken into pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him constantly, night and day. He was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains, and he was gashing himself with stones. Everybody saw these things and said, something is going on with this guy that we don't know. And Jesus steps up and says, it's a spirit come out of him. What did Jesus see? He saw a tormented mind. I'm not here to diagnose somebody in the room. I'm here to teach you how to see when the demonic is at work. And one of the ways to know when the demonic is at work is when someone's mind is constantly tormented, constantly in condemnation, constantly beating themselves up, constantly confused, constantly not knowing what to do in a state of confusion. There's a torment. Another thing we learn from this guy is when others try to help you, but you will not receive help. When others try to help you, here's what happens. Oftentimes, the demon will send you out of the crowd, isolate you. I talked to this about Wednesday night, that depression shuts the mouth. Think about it. There's never a chatty, happy person who is depressed. They can't talk. They have to get quiet. They have to be by themselves. It's what the demon does. It isolates you. So if you're in a place where you are isolated, where you don't want to be around people, you're opening the door for this kind of oppression. Stay around believers. Stay around your friends. Stay around people. Recognize that isolation. Another, violence. Violence. We have men and women who do not understand why they get violent. And I'm telling you, it's a demonic oppression. It's not who you are. It's who you're being oppressed to be. It's the devil saying, hey, this is the right response to this when it's not. Here's another one to learn from this guy. They get comfortable around dead things. Lifeless things. The demonic will want you to be around the things of death and the lifeless things. Why is he in the tomb? Listen to me. He who has an ear, let him hear what I'm saying. Rebellion. The inability to come under authority. A humble heart wants correction. We are so messed up with correction in the church. So messed up. I am so grateful my father knew what discipline was. And I don't even mind saying I'm okay that he understood the leather belt and explained it to me. Because what he wanted for me was the best. And so to get the best, he had to discipline me. He had to get my attention that that was not the direction to go. And in the church right now, we don't want discipline. We don't want correction because we're so sure we're good with God. And yet God puts people in our path to say, you got to come under this authority. They're trying to pour into you and we're rebelling and we're rejecting instead of saying, is there something in there for me? Is there something that would draw me closer to God? If I had a humble heart, listen, I would at least listen to what they had to say. I'm not autocratic. If you know me, that's not the kind of person I am. I'm not dictatorial. But I do believe that sometimes you just got to listen to somebody because they're seeing something in you you don't see in yourself. And they want you to be free from that bondage and free from that anger and free from that frustration. Hear out the discipline. Self-abuse. How many of you knew cutting was in the Bible? 
Cutting is something we deal with in our society today. This is what he was doing. He was grabbing rocks and he was cutting himself. You cut. Well, if you don't see a direct correlation between the demonic and cutting, you just miss that scripture. Drugs, alcohol, different ways that we cut ourselves. We abuse ourselves when the demonic's involved. There's another story of a woman who was bent over in Luke 13, 10 through 13. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness that was caused by a spirit. There is your direct scriptural revelation that oftentimes physical problems are caused by evil spirits. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to a woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. What was Jesus doing? Getting rid of the evil spirit so that the sickness would go away. Now listen to me. I am not devil under every rock guy. I don't believe that every illness and every sickness is caused by a demon. I don't. I believe sometimes it's caused by our stupidity. Sometimes we just do stuff we shouldn't do and we get sick for doing it or we hurt ourselves for doing it. That's life. It's called learning. But I do believe when you're talking about, hear me out, a long-term illness, we need to start looking demonically. A long term. Listen, we were not meant to be ill. We were not meant to be sick. Christ, the Lamb of God, the only Lamb in the entire process, beaten before, um, before uh, crucified, before sacrifice. Every lamb up to that point, every lamb that represented Christ was sacrificed, cleanly, clearly done. But Jesus was beaten before he was sacrificed. Why? Because by his stripes, we get our healing. He takes on the physical abuse to deliver us from the physical. He takes on the spiritual abuse to deliver us from the spiritual. Bondage. Being in bondage to an illness, being bent over for 18 years. There are people who spend their life as a victim to their illness and never recognize that they're in bondage to the illness. And listen to me, church, I don't know how else to say this, but stop professing with your mouth that you're sick. It is crazy. If the power of life and death are in our tongue and we continue to profess death, I have this disease. Yes, you do. Thank you for making it rock solid in your life. The woman with divination in Acts 16, 16 through 18. This is a tough one. It happened that as they were going to a place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her master much profit by fortune-telling, following after Paul. The woman was following after Paul. Wherever Paul went, she went. And us. And she kept crying out, These men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Isn't that a good thing? Sounds like a good thing. She continued to do this for many days. Constant, constant, constant. Talking about how great Paul was. How great these men were. How great the proclamation of salvation was. But Paul was greatly annoyed because sometimes you just get fed up. And he turned to her. And he said to her, no. He said to the spirit. He said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. Man, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Because here's someone praising God and talking about how great they're doing. And they're proclaiming the way of salvation. And these are great men of God. And Paul says, that's an evil spirit. I got to cast that out of you. I don't know about you, but oftentimes in church, when somebody's standing up saying, praise the Lord, this is the greatest church I've ever been in. Nobody says, oh, you got a demon. <laughs> Why did he do that? Because when you begin to see the manifestation of the demonic, you recognize what's of God and what's not. 
always in church, always saying good stuff, never planted in one place, but all over following some man, following some teacher, following somebody and doing it for Jesus, always trying to get close to the leader. These people are always trying to prove they are spiritual. It is the first flag that goes up in my head when someone is trying to prove to me how spiritual they are. Oh, I see this. Oh, I know this. Oh, I know how this works. Oh, I've got a lot of experience with this. Why are you trying to convince me? Can I just say it bluntly and boldly? Do you know how to know if you're a leader? If people are following you. In other words, your fruit should produce the proof. You don't need to try to convince me. Show me. Walk in it, work in it, deliver someone, and then I'll know you understand deliverance. Here's what I'm saying is, you don't have to prove you're spiritual. Just get close to God and He'll give you the opportunity. Take your shoes back out and put them on your feet again. I want you to hear me out. We have to discern the enemy at work. We must have our eyes and ears open to the schemes of the enemy. We must address it when the enemy is causing chaos in the, sh- in the flock. He'll come into the flock by another door. He's in. How do we get him out? We must measure things by their fruit. That is so critical in my life. I have to measure by fruit. I can't measure by words. You cannot measure by my words. Measure by the fruit. We seek out deliverance and healing when our fruit isn't in the spirit. We must humbly recognize the enemy may be oppressing us and we must carry out the work of delivering others from a demonic oppression because good people get deceived. Church, the enemy is crafty, scheming has the opportunity to come after your body, come after your soul, but cannot touch you in the spirit. Here's what Jesus does to equip you to deal with it. Luke 4, 16 through 19. And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written this, Jesus speaking, this is what Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's salvation. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. That's deliverance. He has sent me to recover sight of the blind. That's healing. He sent me to free those who are oppressed. That's the emotional healing. And to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, saying it's now available. He's proclaiming it's now here. The favorable year of the Lord is here. So these things can take place. Jesus came to bring deliverance in all of these ways. In Luke 10, 17, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. And if you think that means you can step on a snake and a bug, you've completely missed the scripture. Go look up serpent in the scripture and see what it represents. What did it represent in the garden? The devil. Go look up scorpions in scripture. Book of Revelation will tell you that's a demonic spirit. That's a demonic host. He said, I've given you authority over the devil and his demons and all over all the power of the enemy. Somebody say all the power. You have authority over all of the power. Listen to me. Jesus said, I have been given all. All authority in heaven and on earth. Now, if he has all authority, how much does the enemy have? Zip. But if he says, I give that authority to you, how much authority do you have over the enemy? All authority over the enemy. And nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not receive this. Uh, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but just rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Here's what I'm saying. 
The enemy is out there. The demonic hosts are out there and they can oppress us in our soul. They can oppress us in our body, but they cannot touch our spirit. And we've been given all authority over that enemy and we have to begin to start rejecting what that enemy wants to do in our life. We have to begin speaking life over each other. We have to begin speaking life over ourselves, and we have to take authority when the enemy has come in and created a problem for us in our soul and in our body. I want you to stand to your feet and I'm going to ask my altar ministers to come forward because some of you are getting delivered today. While my altar ministers have come forward, this is what I want you to do. I believe that for a believer, the enemy gets a foothold in your life because oftentimes we put our foot in the enemy's camp and provide the bridge. What am I saying? What do you know is not right with God in your life? Men, pornography. Open the door to the enemy to mess with you, to mess with your wife, to mess with your children. You are doing that by falling to the temptation of pornography. Ladies, no offense, but bitterness and anger and revenge will open the door. You have got to let those things go. I'm asking you right now as an individual, would you stand before God on your own, not before me, but on your own and confess to Him. You know, the Scripture says, confess to one another your sins. I want you to understand that if you sin against me, I want you to confess that sin to me. But if you did not sin against me, then you need to confess that before God. Right now, what have you got? that you know has opened the door to this demonic, that's opened the door to anger, has opened the door to depression, has opened the door to fear, has opened the door to anxiety. What have you done? What is there? I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying if you open the door, you let them in. Listen to me. It's like leaving your house unlocked. And when you get home, somebody's in your house. Do they own your house? No. Did you let them in? Yes. Do you have the authority to kick them out? Yes. It's your house. It's time right now. If there's something between you and God, if there's something you know that's in your life that's not of God, right now, between you and God, between you and God, just say, God, I confess that. I repent of that. I want to turn from that. I don't want that to be a part of my life anymore. I believe that was good for me. It was bad for me. I don't want it to be there. I'm going to recognize it as bad. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to cast it out. I don't want it. I want you to renounce the lies of Satan in your life. What have I believed that's not true? Have I believed that I'm going to spend my life sick? Have I believed that I'm going to spend my life in pain? Have I believed that I'm unworthy? Have I believed that I deserve condemnation? Have I believed that I'm no good? Get rid of that stuff. It's not of God. God convicts you to be better. God shows you who you are. God's given you a new identity. Get rid of those lies. Right now in this moment, just repent of those things. Now just for this moment, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to place your hands out in front of you because I'm going to speak over you and I want your soul and your body to receive what I'm about to say. Jesus, by the authority you have given me, I take authority over Satan and the demonic spirits and I command you to leave in Jesus' name. These are sons and daughters of God covered in the blood of Jesus and they have overcome by that blood and by the word of their testimony of their belief in Jesus as their Savior. So I take authority over every spirit of bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment and hate and malice or envy or jealousy and I command command you to go. I rebuke every spirit of insecurity or inferiority, rejection, self-hate, destruction, suicide, anger, rage, murder, violence, sexual immorality or impurity, adultery, fornication, lust, pornography, and all forms of sexual impurity. I command you to leave now in Jesus' name. I speak to the spirit of pride, the lying spirit, the Jezebel spirit, rebellion, manipulation, and control 
control and I command you to go. Every spirit of criticism, judgmentalism, arrogance, or racism, prejudice, every spirit of greed, materialism, covetousness, self-ambition, depression, anxiety, addiction, drunkenness, drugs, gluttony, I command you to go. Every spirit of legalism, religious pride, or heresy, of false doctrine, I command you to go. Every spirit stealing, of stealing, of slothfulness, of laziness, of unbelief, of rebellion to authority, I command you to go. Every spirit of guilt and shame and embarrassment and humiliation, I command you to go. Every spirit of sickness, disease, infirmity, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Every spirit of witchcraft, the occult, blasphemy, I command you to go. I break every word curse that you've believed and every spell broken in my brothers and sisters in Christ. I break those spells now. Every generational curse that they believe, I command it to be null and void. All demonic spirits within my hearing, I command you to go and release these people. Release them now in the name of Jesus. I command you to leave this place in the name of Jesus. I cast you out from this place. I set them free in the name of Jesus. Now I want everyone to say with me, Lord, I receive the Holy Spirit. Will you fill me with the Spirit in every place that the evil spirits left? Lord, fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we receive you in Jesus' name. Amen. Two things I want to say before we get out here. Number one, number one, if during that time of prayer you felt it, you felt the release, praise God. But if you felt a tension and an anger rising up in you, I'm telling you, nothing I said should have raised up an anxiety or a tension or an anger. If it is, that's the demonic. And do you know that when Jesus went across the sea to the Gadarene, it says that the Gadarene fell before him because he kept saying, come out, you evil spirit, before he asked his name. So you may not be done today, and that's why these guys are up here up front. You may know, man, there's something still got a hold of me. I don't know what it is I got to confess. I don't know what it is that needs to be said. I don't know what needs to be cleared, but I'm not done. Now, the second thing I want to say is you'll leave here today and the enemy will try to tell you this is all bogus. This is what the enemy has done to the church by telling the church, oh, no, 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 the Holy Spirit and a demon can't be in the same place. You guys are good. It's a good way of telling us don't even think about the demonic and what they're doing in your life. He's going to try to convince you you're not free. He's got to convince you you're still under bondage. He's got to convince you that you're stuck in this way. Listen, don't accept that. You have authority over that demonic presence. Cast it out. Cast it out. Cast it out. So, Father God, this morning, we are looking for the wholeness and the purity and the cleanliness. God, in the name of Jesus, we declare that we have authority over the demonic spirits and we cast them out of this place and out of the life of the believers here in Jesus' name and we receive a full anointing afresh of Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I hope the word today has been impactful. I hope it's been meaningful. I hope there was something said today that struck you in your spirit, that you could ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation on how you can use that in your life today. We thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you join us in the actual services at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning at 851 Johnson Avenue in Stewart, Florida. And if you'd like more information about Revive Church, check out our website. It's reviveusnow.com. God bless. Have a great day.